Hello and welcome back to Rotary Rocketry. Today we have a tutorial for you on how to make our newest PVC case rocket motor. This is one of the easiest motors we've ever built. It's inexpensive and it's powerful. In this video we're going to show you exactly what you need to build this motor yourself. This one we call the Super Monkey. Now you might be wondering what type of rocket can I launch with this size of a PVC sugar rocket motor? Well recently in a video we launched our Eliminator style rocket. This is a 4 inch diameter rocket and that weighs 1260 grams or approximately 2 and 3 quarters pounds. This motor managed to get that rocket to almost 1250 feet or approximately 379 meters. So a very impressive launch for this size motor. We're going to show you in this video every single component and every single tool that you're going to need to make this motor yourself. So let's get started. Before we begin, I just want to say a few words about safety. Building, testing, and launching experimental motors can be dangerous. There's a lot of different factors that can affect how your motor performs compared to how our motor performs. Different brands of PVC or caps may have different strengths. A different brand of potassium nitrate may have different ratios of product which cause it to burn slightly differently. You could have air bubbles or air pockets in your fuel that make a dramatic change to how the fuel burns. Just a lot of different factors come into play when you're making homemade motors. Because of that, I would highly recommend that you always expect the worst. Expect that a homemade experimental motor is going to explode every time you ignite it. Everybody should be at least 200 feet or at least 60 meters away when the motor is ignited for safety. Stay smart, stay safe, let's get started. Now first we have the components for the outer casing. Now here we've got a piece of inch and a quarter PVC pipe. It's seven inches long. Now this is the Schedule 40 PVC. You can't use the thin wall PVC that you would use for like yard irrigation. It needs to be the thicker wall Schedule 40 product. And then we've got two inch and a quarter PVC caps. And then for the nozzle opening inside, we're just using this small washer. Now this is what's called a fender washer. It tends to have a thicker body on it than a standard washer. This is one inch outside diameter. Now this particular one has a 3 16 inch hole in the center, but that's not actually important because we're going to drill that out to 1130 seconds later. So as long as you have a washer that has a hole in the middle that's less than 1130 seconds, it'll be fine. But we do want the one inch outside diameter on this washer, and we'll explain that a little bit further when we get to actually building the nozzle. Now for constructing the nozzle, we need a couple of other items. We need a small piece of paper. We'll get to that a little bit later. And we'll also need one of these foam earplugs. Now there's a couple of different styles of these earplugs in the market. Now I highly recommend this particular shape and style. You see it's round on the back. Um, it doesn't have little wings that stick off of the back portion. Uh, it also is slightly tapered. So we'll see how that gets used uh, in just a little bit, but I do recommend that particular style of earplug for this project. For gluing the PVC parts together, we just have some standard PVC primer and then some PVC cement. For making the nozzle, we're going to need some anchoring cement. Now, I use this particular brand. There's several brands on the market. Um, the reason I use anchoring cement instead of Portland cement or hydraulic cement is that there's a couple of additives in anchoring cement that make it stronger and less brittle. Also, anchoring cement doesn't tend to shrink like other cements do when it dries. So for those reasons, I highly recommend finding a brand of anchoring cement. Now I transfer my anchoring cement from the bag that it comes in into this plastic container with an airtight lid. That keeps moisture from getting to it because I buy it in a large quantity and you really don't want any moisture getting in there if you're going to have it for a long period of time. Now a couple of other things we're going to need is some cooking spray. Now you can use any kind of cooking spray, vegetable oil, canola oil, it really doesn't matter. Um, 
I do recommend that you buy a good quality product though. If you purchase this in some cheap store, like a dollar store or something like that, and you look at the ingredients, you'll see that one of the ingredients is water. You don't want any water coming in contact with your fuel. So buy a good quality one and check the ingredients and make sure that it doesn't contain any water. We're also going to need some glue. Now this can be wood glue or craft glue or school glue. It doesn't really matter. We're just going to need about a drop or two of glue as well. Now, to actually make the fuel, we need three components. This is a sugar-based fuel. It's commonly called flex fuel or flexi fuel. It's made from potassium nitrate, sugar, and corn syrup. Now, the potassium nitrate, I purchased that in bulk. It is in a powdered form already, so it's really easy to make the fuel out of that. Now, you can also purchase potassium nitrate as stump remover in a lot of hardware stores. Now, you do need to make sure that the stump remover that you're purchasing is potassium nitrate. You may need to go to the manufacturer's website to actually find the ingredients of that product because usually on the label it doesn't say. But if you do purchase it as a stump remover, you do have to grind it up because there are big granules that come in that container. So something like a small blender or a coffee grinder and you'll need to make a powder. But I'll put a link down in the description to this particular vendor that I use to purchase this. You can purchase it in all different quantities and the price is fantastic. So check the link out if you need potassium nitrate. Next we have confectioner's sugar or powdered sugar. Now you can use regular sugar for this, but the powdered sugar has a much smaller granule size, which makes it melt and blend better when you go to actually cook the fuel. So that's just standard powdered sugar available in the grocery store. And then we have corn syrup. Now I use this particular brand, but there are other brands. This is a light corn syrup. Now on the ingredients here, we see it's corn syrup, salt, and vanilla extract. Now there's very little salt and very little vanilla extract. For the most part, it's completely corn syrup, but this is another product that you don't want to purchase in a cheap store like a dollar store. That product will be watered down or diluted with some other products. So you wanna buy a name brand and it really shouldn't have anything other than corn syrup, salt, and vanilla extract. And now on to the tools we're going to need. Now we'll need some basic things like a pen and a pair of scissors. Uh, we've got a pair of needle nose pliers, safety glasses, some gloves for when we're making the fuel. Um, we'll need a little mixing cup to mix up the anchoring cement and just a little spoon or a mixing device there. We've got a little plastic container here with a lid that snaps in place. That's going to allow us to mix together some of the chemicals for the fuel. We've got a pan with just a silicone spatula for mixing the fuel together. We have this infrared temperature sensor. We're going to need to uh, measure the temperature of the fuel as we're cooking it and we need a fairly accurate and fast temperature reading. So definitely want to invest in one of those. We've got a gram scale so that we can easily measure out our fuel products. We've got a small electric cooktop here. This allows us to do the cooking process of the fuel in the garage rather than in the house. You want to cook the fuel in a well-ventilated area, so outside in the garage is much better for that. And then we'll need a drill. Now you can either use a hand drill or a drill press. We'll need to drill a hole in one of the end caps as well as drill the orifice hole in the uh, nozzle washer as well. And for doing that, we're gonna need two drill bits and this one is a 7 16 and then this one is 11 30 seconds. Now the last tool we're gonna need is this coring rod. Now this is a round piece of half inch aluminum. Now, I've put a taper on the end here. That's going to be helpful when we actually get to casting the fuel. And we'll see how that's going to work a little bit later. And now this piece is a little bit longer than what we actually need because we're only going to be coring the seven inch piece through the PVC here. But it is helpful to have this a little extra long so as you're coring it, you can see that the rod is straight. If it's really short, you won't be able to see if the rod is slightly crooked. And that's going to be really important when we get to coring that fuel. And then we have this little piece here that I've made. Now this is optional, but it is very helpful for this process. It's on a piece of half inch MDF and it just has a washer on the top and the hole in the center is half inch so that the rod slides onto it like that. 
And then the washer fits into the top of the PVC, just like that. Now again, this is optional, but it is very helpful because it keeps the rod centered in the fuel while the fuel is cooling down. So I would recommend building that as well. Now I've taken one of the PVC caps and drilled a hole in the center of it with the 7 16 drill bit. If you're doing this by hand or on a drill press, make sure you get that hole as centered as possible. And then for that washer, we needed a number 22 nozzle size, which is 22 64 of an inch or 11 30 seconds. So I drilled that out with the 11 30 seconds drill bit. Now one other tool you'll need is a ruler. I've got the earplug here and place it on the ruler. You see that it's exactly one inch long. We need to make a couple little marks around the outside with the pen just to mark the halfway point or the half inch point on that earplug. Now we just want to roll the tip of the earplug just a little bit so that we can get the washer on easily and slide that down just until all those little marks that we made at the half inch point are hidden by the washer. That will give us a half an inch below the washer and a half an inch above the washer. Now we're going to glue the cap with the hole in it onto the end of the PVC pipe. So for that we need to use our PVC primer. And be careful with this stuff, it does stain fabrics and just about anything else that it touches. So we'll put a nice layer of that in the cap and on the pipe. We'll let that dry just for a moment. Now before I apply the glue, we need to take the washer with the earplug and the larger end here, we're just going to pinch that so that it shrinks a little bit. And we're going to drop that down into the hole like that so that it's sticking down through. I'm going to let that expand. That'll hold that in place. Now we'll go ahead and apply the glue. You don't want to apply too much, but you do want full coverage on both parts. Be careful not to get this glue down on the washer down there. And when you put the parts together, you want to give a quarter turn as they go together. And then hold that for about 20 seconds. Now the earplug is sticking down past the end of the end cap here. We just need to gently push that in. And that's going to push that washer up into the motor just a little bit. And we can push that down against the table just to get that nice and flush. And if we look down inside there, which you can't see on the camera, but if I look down inside, you just want to make sure that the washer is nicely centered down in the bottom of the motor. Now I'm going to mix up the anchoring cement. Now you need to follow the directions that come with your particular brand because they may be slightly different than this one. So I'm going to put enough of this powder in here that I know is going to be more than enough for this particular pour. Make sure that you mix up plenty because you don't want to get halfway through pouring it into the motor and realize that you're just a little bit shy of what you need and have to mix up another batch really fast because this does tend to harden really quickly. Now another item we're going to want is a little flashlight. It's going to be really helpful to be able to look down inside there and see what we're doing. So I'll go ahead and mix in a little bit of water. For this particular brand, um, they say that you want the consistency to be approximately that of pancake batter. Now because this is just a tiny bit of anchoring cement, just a couple of drops here and there is going to make a major difference to the consistency. If you find that you put a little too much in here and it's too liquidy, just put a little bit more powder in and thicken that back up. And make sure that you scrape around the corners of your mixing cup and get all of that mixed up. Now for this particular brand, we're going to mix this for about 30 seconds. We've got the consistency that we want and then you need to let it sit 
for one minute. Again, check with your brand on the exact process they want you to use for this, but this one, we're gonna let this sit for one minute before we do anything else. All right, and then after it's sat for a minute, we give it another stir for about another 30 seconds, and then it's ready to pour. Now what we wanna do is completely cover the earplug right to the top of the dome of the earplug but we don't want to put a lot more over that because then it's going to make it hard to poke out the material that's left on there so we're just simply going to pour this down a little bit to start off and you'll see that you'll be pouring it right on top of the earplug and right on top of the washer and we do want to make sure that we get plenty of this anchoring cement underneath the washer and that's why we had the washer that particular size so there'd be plenty of room to get around that washer. And we see that just as the top of the earplug just starts to disappear underneath the material that's when you want to stop and that's exactly where I've got it right now. So we're gonna wait about 25 minutes. I'll go ahead and clean out my mixing container here, and then we'll be able to proceed with this. All right, so it's been 25 minutes. Now definitely check with your brand of anchoring cement for this particular one, 25 minutes is enough for that to be set up and nice and firm. It's not completely dried and cured, but it's nice and firm. Now I'm gonna take my needle nose pliers, just grab onto that ear plug and pull it out. We'll save that for later. We're gonna need that to plug the motor when it's all done. Now, because the anchoring cement kind of covered the top of the earplug just a little bit, there's actually no hole through the center. And we wanna open up that hole. We can use our coring tool. That's one of the reasons that it comes to a nice sharp point there. If we just go down and tap on that center area, we can poke a hole through where the top of the earplug was located. All right, so now that I've got a little opening there, um, if it's hard to open the hole completely just by tapping it with the tip, once you get the hole opened a little bit, you can stick a Phillips screwdriver down in the bottom and just kind of work it through until you get that hole opened up all the way through. Now, if you got any of the anchoring cement on the inside of the motor, now is a good time to just knock that off with the coring rod or a screwdriver or anything else that you can reach down in there and just knock that. It'll come right off of the plastic. And then uh, we're not ready to do the fuel yet because there's a lot of moisture still in that anchoring cement. And you need to give that time to let the moisture evaporate out. You don't want any moisture in direct contact with the sugar fuel. So we're gonna let this sit for at least several hours or overnight and then we'll come back and do the fuel portion. We let this sit overnight. That anchoring cement is nice and hardened and completely dry. Now we're ready to pour the fuel except for one little step. One of the things that makes this motor so easy to make is that we're gonna pour the fuel directly into the motor casing. We don't need any casting jigs. We don't need any paper liners. We just need some fuel. But unfortunately there is a hole at the bottom of the motor. And so if we pour the fuel in now, the fuel's just gonna run down that hole. That's where our little piece of paper comes in. I've got a little piece of the inch and a quarter PVC here. I'm just gonna draw a little circle inside there and then cut that out. I'll cut it out just inside the line so that it's a little bit smaller than what we actually have for the inside diameter. And then we'll take our glue and just put a very tiny, tiny bit of glue on there. We're just gonna spread that around the outer edge. We don't need any glue in the center because that's where the hole is and we don't wanna make the center of the paper any stronger because we're gonna poke down through this piece of paper with our coring rod. And that's another reason that the coring rod has a very sharp tip on it so they can easily poke through the paper. Now this next part is a little bit tricky. You've got to drop this down into the motor and have it land glue side down onto the top of the anchoring cement. 
Now be prepared, sometimes you might have to dump it back out and try it again. A lot of times it falls down just the right way, but not every time. And that time, of course, it landed backwards. And that time, it landed right. Now I'm going to use the back side of the coring rod, the flat end, just to gently tap that down so that it glues itself down to the top of the anchoring cement. Here we've got everything to make our fuel. We've got our mixing container and our scale. We're going to just turn that on and then place the container on the scale and zero out that container weight. We need 178 grams of potassium nitrate. And then we're going to zero out that weight. And we need 46 grams of powdered sugar. And then we're going to cap this off. I'm going to shake this for several minutes to mix those two ingredients. And the last ingredient we need is the corn syrup. Now we're not going to pour the corn syrup into a container and then pour that into our pan because if you do that a whole bunch of it is going to stay in your little container and you're not going to get the amount of corn syrup in your fuel that you think you measured out. So we're going to pour that directly into the pan so there's no waste. So we'll put the pan on the scale, zero that out, and then we need 49 grams of corn syrup. We're out in the garage to make the fuel. Don't forget your safety glasses. And it is always a good idea to have a fire extinguisher. This is very flammable. First thing we're going to do is take our cooking spray and just give a quick coat on the coring rod. We don't want a lot of excess on there. Just want a good coating. And then you can start heating up the corn syrup in the pan. We'll just start that on low for the moment. Get our powder ready here. Now this powder is very flammable, so keep it away from the heat. And when you pour it into the pan, make sure it doesn't poof all over the place and get onto the heating element. You also really want to do this with an electric cooktop. You really shouldn't do this with an open flame. Once that corn syrup starts bubbling, I'm just going to gently pour in the powder. Turn up the heat a little bit and start stirring that. It looks really, really dry to begin with, but it will eventually all melt together. It's only been about a minute and now it's just a complete syrupy liquid. We're going to continue heating this on medium to medium high heat, constantly stirring. It's going to get kind of frothy and bubbly around about 180 to 190 degrees. And after that we'll constantly use our temperature probe here just to check the temperature and we're trying to get up to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so it's been about five minutes. It's reading around 230 degrees consistently. Turn off the cooktop. Now it is a little airy. I'm just going to kind of move it around with the spatula a little bit, trying to get some of those air bubbles out. It is very helpful to have somebody else holding the motor up vertical for you. Otherwise, you could build a little jig or, or hold it really gently in a vise. But having a second person is really helpful for this. All right, so we don't want to let that cool down too much. We're going to pour it 
into the motor. Now we're not gonna quite pour all the way to the top. We're gonna leave about half an inch or so with no fuel because we still need to put the coring rod down into the fuel. If we fill all the way to the top and you push that big rod down inside, it's just gonna overflow on the sides. But we may need some more of this just to top that off. So I'm gonna get the rest of the remains on the spatula here and then just get that on the bottom of the pan. Now this is still a little bit warm here, so that's okay, it's not hot, it's been off for a little while. So we'll go ahead and just leave that on there. That'll keep that fuel a little bit warm. And in the meantime, we'll come over here and we wanna run the coring rod down through the center. Now this is where it was really helpful to have the rod a little extra long because we can see that we're keeping it straight. We need to hit the paper right in the center where we can poke through into the opening for the nozzle. If you don't feel that poke through, just move it around a little bit and as soon as you feel it poke through the paper, just push down. Now you can verify that you've poked through. If you're not exactly sure, you can look down in the bottom and you'll see the little tip of the coring rod down there. Now we see that we haven't filled up the pipe all the way, so we can take a little bit of fuel. It's hardened up a little bit. We'll just give this just a few seconds to heat back up with the cooktop, and then we'll just top off the top here. There's really plenty of time to work with this because it's very, very hot. The pipe is getting hot. The coring rod, you don't want to touch that. It's very hot. Just take a little bit on the spatula, pour that in there. Sometimes it's easier to have like a little spoon or screwdriver to help spread that out. If you have gloves on, you could get in there and work with the fuel, but Without gloves, you do not want to touch that. It's still really hot and you can get burned. All right, I'm just gonna clean up the top here a little bit. If there's some excess on the top of the PVC, we'll just gently scrape that off. And take our centering tool, slide that down, and push it right into the top of the PVC pipe. That will center the rod and then we can just leave this to cool down for several hours. Now you're gonna have a little leftover fuel in the pan and on your mixing stick, and you might even have some that got down on your working surface. Now the best way to dispose of this is just to dilute it in water. I'm gonna bring this to the kitchen sink and just run this in water and let water sit in the pan and dissolve all that fuel and just run it down the drain. That'll make it completely harmless. Now it's been about an hour. It's not completely cool, it's just barely warm. We can go ahead and slide that off. And then sometimes the rod will come right out, which this one is easy. If you need to, you can just put a pair of pliers on the end and just kind of spin it and pull it, and it should pull straight out nice and easy. Now there's just a little bit of fuel it got onto the PVC around the top here. We just clean that off. And then we're ready to glue our cap on. We need to use the PVC primer first. We'll let that sit for just a moment. And then we're ready for PVC cement. Again, you want a good solid coverage on there, but you don't want a huge puddle of cement. But you do want a nice layer on both parts. And when you put this together, you just give it a quarter turn and then hold that in position for about 10 or 15 seconds while that sets up. Now we're gonna take the earplug that we use to make the nozzle, just roll that up a little bit and put that down into the nozzle. 
just flush with the end. We want to keep the humidity in the air from getting into that fuel. We want to keep that nice and dry until this is ready to launch. And you should let that PVC cement harden for at least a couple of hours before you take this out for a launch. Now for this type of rocket motor, it's very common to have a convergent and a divergent on the nozzle. Now this particular one doesn't because of the way the earplug was used to cast the anchoring cement, it's essentially a straight hole through the entire nozzle. Now a convergent is on the inside where the gases are approaching the nozzle. It's an angle that just directs all the gases straight towards the center of the nozzle. The divergent is the exact opposite on the other side where the gases come out of the nozzle and are allowed to expand. And that helps with the efficiency of the motor's thrust. Now we did notice something very interesting when we were testing this motor. It seems to form its own convergent and divergent while it's working. So on the inside here, you can see that there's a slight bevel that it forms in the anchoring cement pointing everything towards the center of the nozzle. And then if we look on the other side, this is how we start out with the small hole, but we end up at the end of the burn with a divergent angle and a much larger opening. So it forms those angles as it's burning, which I think really helps with the efficiency of this motor overall. And now we're gonna take this exact motor that you just watched us build. We're gonna load it up into our Eliminator rocket and take it out and show you exactly how it performs. All right, we're out here at the launch site. We've got the motor here. Now I do want to show the ignition system we use for this. You do have to ignite uh, sugar motors from the top, not from the bottom, so you can't use a fuse or a wick. You have to use an electric ignition system. We use these little uh, electric igniters. And that just goes up through the nozzle. Now there is a little air space at the top of the motor because of the way that the cap is shaped with the dome. So I like to go up until it hits the top and then come back about a half an inch. And that way I know that the igniter is down in the core of the fuel. And then to activate that igniter, we have this little remote control device here. This one connects to the igniter. And then with the remote control, we can be 500 feet away and safely light the motor for the ignition. So the flight computer is telling us we got to a thousand feet. It's a little bit less than the altitude we reached with the same rocket and the same motor in our last launch, but still it was a nice impressive launch. If you find any of the information we gave in this video helpful or you use any of it to make your own rocket motors, we'd love to hear from you. Leave a comment. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.